Welcome to the second short lecture on fracture and fatigue, topic six. Today we'll be focusing on properties that have to deal with how things break, in particular the important property of toughness, or sometimes known as fracture toughness. Toughness relates to how we design products to avoid failure, called fracture mechanics, which we'll talk about today, and also to fatigue, which is how products fail under cyclic repeated loadings particularly dangerous type of failure because we never see it coming when it happens. We'll talk about that in the next short lecture. Let's talk about toughness first and understand what it is and what it isn't. Remember that strength is the ability of a material to resist the onset and continuation of plastic deformation. Or another point way of saying it is that the strength of a material which we show here, let me switch to the pen, which is labeled right here, is the stress at which the material goes from experiencing elastic deformation to experiencing plastic deformation. So strength is simply a measure of how much stress it takes to cause something to plastically deform. It doesn't tell us anything about how much that material will actually plastically deform. For that we need ductility, or the strain at failure. So ductility is represented by the end of the stress-strain curve, which is this line right here. We might label this epsilon f for the strain at failure. Toughness is the combination of both strength and ductility. In other words, it's the ability of the material to absorb mechanical energy. And it turns out that energy is the area underneath the stress-strain diagram. How can we know that? Well, remember that the equation for work is W equals force times distance, which I could rewrite as force over area, where area is constant times change in length or distance traveled over a constant original length which is equal to stress times strain. So we can see that the work it takes to break a material is equal to stress times strain or the area underneath the stress strain curve. How are strength and toughness related? We should expect that materials that are strong should also be tough and for the most part that's true. As we increase in yield strength among all the materials we see that their fracture toughness tends to go up as well. A good example of this is medium carbon steel. Medium carbon steel is used for many applications. It's probably the most commonly used type of steel and we can see that it is both very strong and very tough. Another example of a strong and tough material are the aluminum alloys shown here by this red balloon. This is why aluminum alloys are used for aircraft cabins because they're both lightweight and tough enough to withstand the cyclic pressures that they experience. Carbon fiber composites are another good example. But you'll notice that carbon fiber composites are beginning to fall off this primary line that we see here. We can draw a line right through most of these materials relating toughness to strength. The carbon fiber begins to, to fall off that line and the reason is that carbon fiber materials are somewhat brittle and therefore have lower toughness. The area under their stress strain curve is not as high as you would think given their strength. A very good example of this are the ceramic materials shown here such as tungsten carbide. These materials are very strong as, as evidenced by the fact that they're far to the right on the x-axis but have very low ductility sometimes less than one percent which makes them brittle and therefore they have small area under the stress strain curve and therefore a lower toughness. Now it's also true that materials can be very very ductile such as polymers but have low toughness because they have low strength. We also see this in the rubbers and in the foams. Natural materials also follow this rule, including wood and stone. 
So strong materials must have a high yield strength, but tough materials must be both strong and ductile, and that's the key. And I'll circle it with red just to make it more impressive on you. Strong and ductile. Brittle materials, such as ceramics, might be very strong, but they lack toughness and are still dangerous to use. There are different kinds of toughness, it turns out. There's what we call static toughness, which is what we've been talking about, and that's the energy absorbed at fracture in a tensile test. So again, here is the ductile material, and you can see the area under the stress strain curve is how much energy is absorbed when it fractures. And we have a brittle material, which has a very high strength, higher than the ductile material, but because it fails at a low strain to failure, it absorbs very little energy in the act of fracture. It has a lower toughness. There is also impact toughness, which is the energy absorbed when a material is rapidly loaded and broken. And finally, there is fracture toughness, which is the most important, and is the energy absorbed by the failure of a specimen when that specimen has a crack. So, for example, in the case of the Aloha Airlines disaster, the airframe, of the skin of the airplane, contained a crack, which eventually led to failure. So let's take a look at the same material under two different loadings. So this is the idea of impact toughness. So we'll start off over here with silly putty in the form of a ball that is simply laid down onto a table. And what you can see is that the silly putty, because it's being loaded fairly slowly, exhibits a very high amount of plastic deformation. Silly putty absorbs a lot of energy when loaded under low strain rate conditions. But if I'm to whack the same ball of silly putty with a hammer at high speeds and therefore a high strain rate, we see that we get a very different behavior. The silly putty ruptures and fails in a brittle way with the material experiencing very little, if any, plastic deformation. So strain rate is very important. We could demonstrate the same phenomenon by using different temperatures. If I had the silly putty at room temperature, it would behave like the low strain rate material. If I had it at freezing temperatures and I set it on a table and hit it with a hammer, it would fracture. So let's take a look now at fracture mechanics, now that we understand the concept of toughness. So fracture mechanics deals with failure under static loads, meaning loads that aren't changing. So in fracture, the applied stress, for example, air pressure inside of a pressurized aircraft cabin, raises the energy of the system, and we call that energy G. And that energy gets high enough to eventually reach a critical energy called G sub C, or G critical. And that G critical is the energy needed to make a crack grow. So that crack might be a small pinhole, or a crack around a bolt, or maybe a little bit of corrosion that eventually grew into a crack. So G sub C is a material property. It is the material's resistance to that crack being moved. So when G, the energy in the system, equals G sub C, the material property, or what we call toughness, fracture occurs. Well, it turns out that the system energy G is related to the applied stress, the size of the crack, and the elastic modulus of the material. And it's given by this equation. The energy of the system G is equal to the stress squared times pi times the crack size divided by the elastic modulus. I can reorganize this equation to put the system variables on one side and the material properties on the other side. So here I get sigma times the square root of pi a equals the square root of e times g sub c, where I've replaced g with g sub c, the fracture toughness, which is a material property. So here we have elastic modulus and toughness, both material properties. And over here I have the stress I apply to the system and the crack size that I have in the system, neither of which is a material property, but do account for how bad the crack is. So fracture toughness, or K sub C, is the material property that describes the ability of a material to withstand the presence of a crack when under stress. Or written mathematically, K sub C is proportional to the square root of E times G sub C, the static fracture toughness.
So more often than not, we simply think of the fracture toughness, K sub C, of a material, which has units, if you work it out, of megapascal square root meter, or in English units, KSI square root inch. Well, K sub C can be measured for materials, unlike G sub C. Typical values range from up to 100, or for example, 87 for a medium carbon alloyed steel like 4340, used commonly in aircraft, all the way down to 0.75 for soda glass, or the glass that's used in glass bottles. It turns out the glass is very strong, which is why we use it for glass fiber composites, but if you drop glass, it shatters because it has such a low fracture toughness. It can't withstand the presence of a crack. Notice also that polymers like nylon and polymethyl methacrylate have low fracture toughness values as well. They too lack sufficient strength to provide resistance to the motion of a crack. Okay, so now we know that a material has a property called the fracture toughness. But we have a bigger problem, and that's understanding when will a crack actually move based on how bad that crack is. In other words, how do we define how bad a crack really is? To do that, we come up with a concept called stress intensity, or K. This is a variable that defines the severity of the stresses at the tip of a crack. It's the stresses at the tip of the crack that will actually propagate the crack forward. It's defined by the size of the crack and the magnitude of the applied stresses, and is therefore not a material property. So this equation might look familiar to you. It's the other half of the equation from G sub C. The stress intensity is equal to Y, where Y is a geometry correction factor, times the stress acting on the material, times the square root of pi times the crack size A. So again, the units for K are megapascal square root meter, or KSI square root inch. The same units we saw for K sub C, or the toughness. So just like with the static toughness, fracture toughness can tell us when a material will break if the stress intensity is greater than or equal to K sub C. Therefore, fracture occurs under two conditions. If I replace K in the previous equation with K sub C, fracture occurs when K sub C equals Y times the stress times the square root of pi times a critical crack, A sub C. Or K sub C equals Y times the critical stress times the square root of pi A. Now there's two different equations which really are solving for the same thing but apply to two different situations. In the first case I might have a crack of a critical size or I have a constant stress acting on a pressure vessel like say an airplane but I want to know how big can a crack be when that plane will fail and that skin will rupture. Or I might have cracks of a known size and I'm wondering how much stress can I apply on the on the surface of that plain skin before it eventually ruptures. In other words, fracture will occur when either A reaches the critical crack size A sub C or when the stress sigma reaches the critical stress level sigma sub C. We can design to deal with each of these conditions. In the engineering design process I can make sure that the stresses applied to the material are always below sigma C by some factor of safety. In addition, in the manufacturing operation, I can make sure that I don't introduce any cracks of critical size A sub C. So finally we have the geometry correction factor, Y. Well, Y is typically around the value of 1. Let's write that down. Y is approximately equal to 1. although it can vary from about 0.8 all the way to 1.25. It's dependent on a number of factors, which include the shape and size of the crack, the specimen shape and size, and also what the loading method is, whether it's being pulled in tension, bending, shear, or so on. We'd have to look into large manuals that tell us exactly which condition we have and what the correct Y factor to use is. But suffice to say, for most of our applications, we'll either be told what Y is, 
or we can assume it has a value of approximately 1.